Lee Wisdom guest edition and today I have Dr. Kat and I'm just going to be adding her to the conversation. She'll be joining shortly. Hmm. Well, join. Can you can you see my request for you to join the Instagram live? Yes. Yes. Let's go. There we go. There we go. I I think I think. Oh gosh. That's it. Come on, Instagram, work with me. Instagram seems to not be playing ball. It's feeling as cold and flu as I am, I think. Hey. Hi, guys. Just waiting for Dr. Cat to join. I've added her to the Instagram. I'm just waiting. I think Instagram is a lot. Cold one too. It's feeling flowy. It wants to get to bed. It's not time for bed. Come on, come on, Instagram. Here we go. Are we at the top? Uh, fantastic. I was just saying, Instagram's feeling as cold as I am today. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a Twitter girl. I'm not an Insta girl. I'm not. Uh... Sure how this works. Can you hear me okay? I can. I'm so glad that you've joined today. I'm really excited to talk to you. I was Thank actually you. just being an absolute nerd in prep and listening to your TED talk again. And I was like, I don't know what anyone who makes, like, you make the body seem as interesting as other people make space sound. And I was like, what? That's really cool. I don't know. That's I, really cool. I, find, I just find, like, our cells are fascinating. And you get, you know, people going like, oh, look all, all up in the stars and the moon. And I'm like, your body genuinely is amazing all the stuff that happens i think is fantastic i think that's really cool i was really enjoying myself but actually let's start by introducing you to everyone so we have dr cat and she's amazing she's a science writer communicator we can't forget she's got a phd from cambridge and she's also studied at the imperial doing her postgrad so she's got the brains to back all of this you can also see her on radio, you write for magazines and newspapers, and of course, a really incredible TED Talk that I recommend, but also your new book, Rebel Cells, where you look at cancer and talk about evolution, which sounds really fascinating, and hopefully you'll tell us a bit more about that today. But I mean, broadcaster, presenter, podcaster, radio, writing, everything, and scientist as the bedrock of everything. So I really can't wait to learn more about your story today and what made you want to follow this pathway. Because I mean, you got brains for days. <laughs> How did that come about? Were you always interested in science? Well, it's, it's always very embarrassing when people are like, oh, you've done this. It's like, yeah, and sometimes I can't put the right shoes on. So, you know, <laughs> let's keep, keep some humility. Um, but yeah, I've always just been really fascinated by how the world works. Like when I was a kid, I was the kind of kid who, you know, I kept snails. And um, my parents got me a chemistry set when I was quite young. I must have been maybe like seven or eight. And my, my dad, my parents aren't really sciencey at all. My granddad was a doctor and like sort of way back there, some like electrical engineering in the family. But neither of my parents are particularly scientific. But my dad was like, right, we'll, we'll do some chemistry, I guess. Um, and I remember, you know, making indicators out of cabbage and growing crystals and using up all the copper sulfate first and then not being able to do the fun experiments that were blue because copper sulfate's blue. Um, but yeah, I was always really interested in in how the world works and, and nature and the body and, and all this kind of stuff. And then, um, yeah, so I, I did all the science subjects at school and I was like, I'm going to be a scientist, going to be a scientist and uh, went to do sciences degree. Um, I did a, a natural sciences degree at Cambridge, which is a bit of sort of a pick and mix because I was just interested in all kinds of science. So um, I got to do bits of physiology and pharmacology and chemistry and biochemistry and molecular biology and all this kind of stuff. But really realizing that I was really interested in sort of cells and DNA. Um, I think one of my, my GCSE biology teacher, Dr. Richards, he was the person who did a lot of the kind of more molecular biology stuff and got us to make the models of DNA out of paper. I'm like, yeah, this stuff, DNA love it 
Um, I say, I, then I, I did my degree. I then went on to do a PhD because I was like, well, that's how you become a scientist, right? You gotta do a PhD. And I did that and started to find things quite struggle. Um, my PhD was very, very disjointed. I So I look back, back now and I think I just was like, I'm on this path. I've got to do my, got to do my A levels in science. I've got to do my degree. I've got to do my PhD, and then I become a scientist. And I didn't really think that actually being a research scientist is about having, you know, a, a project and a focus and like drilling down and down and down into one question. Mm. I wanted to be a scientist because I was just fascinated by all the things. Um, wanted to understand how the world worked and like how do you go from dna and make a baby like, that's amazing uh and i was working for my phd i was in the Gurdon institute in cambridge and it's um it's a fascinating institute because on the top floor were the developmental biologists so that was what i did i was understanding basically how do you take a sperm and an egg and put them together and unwrap all those that two completely separate genomes mm. put them together and, and make life happen mm. so on the top floor there was people studying mammalian development and fly development and worm development and frogs and then on the bottom floor were all the cancer biologists and so they were mm. trying to understand like what happens when cells start multiplying in the wrong way like in a bad way and we were on the yeah. top floor finding out how what happens when it goes right um but the labs that i um i mean i'm going to be honest here the labs that i used to go out drinking with were the labs that were <laughs> Not gonna lie, uh, there's a lot of drinking involved in my PhD because none of my experiments work. So I used to go out to the pub. Um, but a lot of the labs that I was hanging out with, the guys, they were in a, a lab with Tony Kazarides. And that's the lab where they were really studying how do genes get turned on and off and studying the histone proteins. These are like these balls that DNA gets wrapped around and you can kind of unwrap it and you can label it. And, and that's how cells know what genes to turn on and turn off. So I really got into this idea of like, how the genes turn on and turn off and, and make cells do things, whether that's good or bad things. So I was really interested in that. My PhD was a bit of a mess, um, four completely disconnected chapters. Don't know how I got it. Um, I walked into my Viva, uh, my PhD Viva, where they kind of, you, you have two people, they examine your PhD and, um, and they said, uh, well, the, the good news is that you've passed. I was like, Oof, I'll be in the pub in an hour. Uh, and then they proceeded to just destroy me for about three and a half hours. So I just came out like a broken shell of the woman um, and went to the pub. And, um, and yeah, from that, I was like, well, I'm going to be a scientist. So I've got to do a, I'll do a postdoc. And I was applying for postdocs all over the place. Um, I, the, the true story is I wanted to go to Edinburgh. Well, actually, I really wanted to go to America because everyone from my institute went to America to do their mm. postdoc. And I was like, okay, that's what you got to do. Um, my boyfriend at the time was uh, training to be a doctor and he said, I can't go to America to be a doctor. It's mental over there. Uh, so he was like, no, you have to stay in the UK. So I was like, all right, I'll go to Edinburgh. There's loads of labs in the field that I'm really interested in in Edinburgh. So I got a position in Edinburgh. And then he said, well, no, that's, that's still basically another country um so he wouldn't go <laughs> so i you know i i will talk about this later but i don't think there's such a thing as a wrong choice but i chose to stay with him and go to london and ended up in um the imperial college uh, medical research institute so this is the the, I love the fact that imperial was like oh i guess i have to go there instead that's just <laughs> well wild. it was wild. kind of the the woman who offered me a position was the woman who went to my phd examiner and i was like literally like i've got nothing here like i had all these jobs lined up in edinburgh i can't do them i don't know what to do have you got space in your lab and she managed to find some money and some space um but yeah gradually things just got worse and worse and i was like this is not working out because i was a very very clumsy um so it was just very difficult. I was working with these tiny, tiny embryos and it was all terrible. Um, and also I had a really short attention span. So I wanted to like do all the science and all the things and all the experiments and not focus for three years on one project. I wanted to like every new paper that came out, I was like, oh, we could do this. And what about this? And yeah, this is a great story. Um, and also now I was uh, living in London with a man who I'd come to deeply resent for crushing my dreams. So you know, that's kind of, uh, so that's where we were at. Um, 
And in the end, I left. I left the lab. Um, I started, I had started to get involved in science communication just before that point. So I'd been involved in, um, when I was at university, I'd written for the university newspaper. I'd got involved with a radio show called The Naked Scientists. I was doing mm -hmm. school stuff. And also the, the boss of the lab, the woman who took me in, um, Professor Amanda Fisher, Professor Dean mm -hmm. Amanda Fisher, yeah. um, she was really into science communication and really supporting me to do that and so she was running all these amazing programs of um bringing researchers together with artists and fashion designers and all this kind of stuff so she was very encouraging and um and through all that experience that i had i managed to get a job at cancer research uk mm. and again you know I sort of you you think oh you must have had jobs all over the place like no i was applying for all sorts of jobs and see uk were the only people who offered me one um, well, weren't they lucky and I, went, I read that you raised eight million pounds for them with one of your campaigns. Yeah, just eight no makeup million. face. I have got one. I mean, you have to tell me about that. I know. I I know. Tell you about that. Um, I'll make a note about that one. Um, but yes, yeah, so I I went to Cancer Research UK. I was really worried I hadn't got the job because in the interview I was just so excited about the po possibility of becoming a science communicator and learning about all the science talking about all the science and I took in a scarf that I was knitting for my boss of this like bright pink DNA scarf I was like this is how much I love science and DNA I was like I'm knitting it Lord. and at the time my sister was a recruitment consultant and she walked I, I walked out and I spoke to her and she was like oh well may, maybe someone else will offer you a job um, but, but they offered me a job and I stayed there for 12 years and it was just amazing I got to move through a whole bunch of different areas, uh, working with the marketing teams. I was a national media spokesperson, so getting to go on the, the BBC sofa, um, getting up you know, to go on the Today programme at 5 a.m. and all that kind of stuff. I got to train our scientists in science communication. Um, I got to set up the Cancer Research UK blog with two of my colleagues, um, Henry Scowcroft, who's now head of comms at Alzheimer's Research UK, and a, a science writer that some people may have heard of called Ed Yong. Uh, he's now He's now like a super famous science writer in America, but you know, it was me, Ed and Henry set up the Cancer Research UK blog when blogging was new. Um, I set up the Cancer Research UK podcast in 2006 before people listened to podcasts. So that was a tough gig. And um, yeah, I just got to do amazing, amazing things. Uh, and then in 2016, I left. And the reason that I left is again, because I have a very short attention span. I'd been freelancing and, and doing all this stuff on the side. I'd be doing science radio, um, doing stuff with the naked scientists. I was making some Radio 4 documentaries. I was writing because at work, really, at Cancer Research UK, you only get to work write about cancer. And so I thought, there's more science and there's more stories and I want all the science and to write all about it all. Um, so I, I was doing that. And that, in the end, led to the offer of writing a book. Um, so I wrote a book. I took some unpaid leave off work to do it. The book came out in 2016. I quit my job. I went freelance um, and I've basically not had a day off since. Uh, I did like 60 talks in a year. Um, yeah, it was, a, that was a wild year. And so from there, I was like, I'm going to be a science writer. I'm going to be a science writer, broadcaster, journalist, every kind of thing. Um, and then just started getting more work than I could deal with, and particularly work coming in from really exciting you know, research organisations, um, startups, all these kind of companies working in the life sciences area that couldn't find people who could understand the science and then tell the story of the science. Mm -hmm. And got more and more of this work. Like, ah! um, started getting people to help me do it and then realised I was running a business. <laughs> And so from 20, since 2018, I've been running a science communication agency. Uh, we're called First Create the Media. We're now five years old, a team of 10 people. And we work with amazing organisations just in the life sciences, but startups, larger organisations, research organisations, charities, bigger companies, just helping them talk about their science and, and stories in their science, the audiences that they're trying to reach. So I will stop talking now. That's so cool. I love it. You are very good at telling stories. I was absolutely riveted. It was a bit like your TED talk. I was like, I would just talk. I love it. 
because you're so energetic and passionate about what you're doing and it definitely comes all the way through your story and i love i love what you mentioned about there's no wrong decision and is that something that you would say is like a wisdom you would share <laughs> Yeah, so that was actually one of, you asked me for three wisdoms yeah. and that is definitely one because I've, I've definitely had times I've had at least twice in my life mm -hmm. when I've basically completely rebooted my life. So mm -hmm. in my mid twenties, this was when I was doing my postdocs. So I was in, in the lab, just, I was completely miserable. I was stuck. Yeah, I was stuck in a lab that overlooked Wormwood Scrubs Prison in West London. I was really unhappy with the work I was doing. I just, mm -hmm. I knew that I didn't have the kind of the focus and the mm -hmm. um, that kind of like, you know, question, experimental planning yeah. thing that a, a lab scientist needs to have. It's like, I don't have that. Mm -hmm. I, I can read papers. I love them. I can tell people about them. I can't think of the next experiment to do. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. And also, so again, living with a man who by this point, like, things, things were very bad. Um, so, yeah, I pretty much, like, left the lab, left CIUK, left, uh, left the guy, um, and, like, re completely rebooted my life. Um, I went off, I moved out, went to live in East London, joined loads of bands, did all sorts of stuff, went to, you know, doing stuff with CIUK. Um, and that was, that was great for a long time. And then, again, so when I... When I went freelance, that was another reboot. Um, I had a lot of bad luck with men. So I, by this point, I'd married someone else. And then in, in like the year that I brought my book out, I'd like brought my book out, quit my job and got divorced. So I was like, right, you did the just start again. <laughs> oh, and then I turned 40. So it's like, right, let's, do, let's, let's just go it. for it. Yeah, completely. I was just doing this. Um, so yeah, I really... There's, there's, they, you think on the surface, like, oh, my God, these are big things. It's like completely changing your, like, personal life and your, like, working life. And But for me, they've always seemed like, well, that's a decision that you take. And then you make it the right decision. I don't, I don't really believe in, like, thinking, oh, well, you know, what, what if? I'm like, right, well, we're here now. So what are we going to do? And um, I don't know, did you see the TV series Devs? When it was out a couple of years ago. What's it serious? Devs. Devs. I don't think so. Tell me about it. Yeah. So it's this kind of very weird dystopian sci-fi set with like um, people who are working on a supercomputer. It's as yeah. far as I can tell you. But there's um there's a character. One of the characters basically discovers something that like she shouldn't have done, mm. and she's now like her life has changed. She has to leave the life she has. And one of the other characters says to her this sentence, and I, I've got it written down and I'm next to my desk because I think it's so important. They say, the life you once had is gone. The choice you now have is about the life you have next. Mm. And so that is know. like... Wait, say that again. I really feel like I want to like make sure I hear that. Right. The life you once had mm -hmm. is gone. So once mm -hmm. you've made a decision or done something like that, like whatever has happened, that that's that's done you can't change it mm. right the choice you have is about the life you have next so you at the point before the rest of the, yeah. your life has happened you have choices about how you're now going to ride that mm. out so you can't go <laughs> and that's back, I'm done so yeah, every choice yeah. now is about making this work in the future yeah exactly so you, you, did you did you watch that show before you made these big punts because obviously yeah, you made no, I, I watched that show that show came out in the pandemic so it only came, it came out a couple of years ago but also it kind of really profoundly spoke to me during the pandemic because there was like you know life kind of stopped as it was and like there were all these changes and, and worries and all of this and it's like well we are where we are now we now have to choose how we're going to go forward from here mm. and um and i was like oh that really chimes with my my attitude um so yeah that's definitely something i always always live by that's that's one of the things i've got pinned on my desk i love that uh, next i do love that actually it's about i guess making things work because i think we spend a lot of energy worrying about the future and looking to the past so i guess you yeah made a decision and you're going to live with it and make choices that make it tenable but what i love that you said it earlier i want to reflect on some of your story is that you are almost able to acknowledge where you're not working in your strengths and not having fun and you seem to yeah 
people have like built fun into what you do like i know you're referring to the pub but i'm guessing it's like just generally fun and like you know the music and the bands you said you were part of because i think you do music with your sister right like that yeah. seems to be like a thread throughout throughout everything like i want to know more about that mindset I'm, I'm curious the mindset people i think actually have really cool lives like what's the thing behind it yeah so th this is interesting I've, I've got a lot to say about this um and uh, I, will, I will come back, I'm going to make a note as well to talk about party hats, because I, uh, I was talking about that with um, one of the women who I manage at work today. But yeah, I think, um, I mean, I've always yeah, the thing, done things outside work, like music is a really big thing for me. At one point, I was playing in like five bands. That was too much. Now I just play in one band. Um, we've been together for about 20 years because we just can't be bothered to split up. It's, it's, <laughs> we get together, we do a gig every so often. It's fine. Um, but yeah, I think for me, so quite a, while, a long time ago, um, there was the fad for doing the Myers-Briggs tests mm -hmm. and, you know, workplaces would make people do it. And I know some people are absolute advocates of it. I am absolutely not because I think it really boxes people in and it says you're like this and you're like this and you're like this and you've got a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this. And you know, I, I I feel they're a bit kind of tantamount to horoscopes. They're like, you, you're just saying someone is like this. And I feel that that kind of um, defining someone by going like, oh, you're in one of these four or 16 or nine boxes, um, I think is incredibly limiting. Mm. And I did a different, you know, personality strengths thing that was, it was called, it was called Now Discover Your Strengths. Okay. But it was just all about like, well, what are your actual strengths? And I got all the team to do it at Cancer Research UK. And it was like, so it's not about, oh, what type are you? And put you in that type. It was, okay, well, you're really good at the getting down and attention to detail. And mm -hmm. you're really good at the getting out and showing off. Uh, that's my one. Um, and it gives you like kind of five or six strengths. And you're like, oh, okay, these are my strengths. I'll play to those. And someone else in the team, you're like, oh, actually, they really love doing that kind of thing so i won't worry that i'm doing this and they're not getting to because actually they don't want to and that it's not their strengths mm -hmm. and um we've been doing a lot of stuff in my company at the moment about what jobs need doing by who and what are people's strengths and i was talking to my um my director of strategy philippa and um she's someone who we've moved through loads of different roles in the company just because we've been growing and like i don't know someone needs to do this one mm -hmm. needs to do that and we've talked a lot about wearing different hats and she's like everything I do I feel like I enjoy you know maybe, maybe I'll have to wear a hat that I don't like it's like no every, every hat should be a party hat like you should <laughs> every hat should be a party yeah, hat yeah like I love you should feel like you enjoy it and you mm -hmm. and that your role is playing to your strengths because if it's not I'm not getting the best out of you and so mm. that's like a waste of a, a person because she's mm. really really good at doing some things i'm really good at doing some things mm. terrible at doing other things well the first person i hired was someone to do my admin and organizing because oh boy that is that is not my thing um but yeah i i think um i've been very you know very lucky i guess that i get to do this kind of job that i i love and it lights me up and the thing that surprised me is actually building a team i i always thought i was alone i was a lone ranger you know i'm, I'm just my lone science writer freelance and now i have a team and mm. actually that is the biggest joy I, I love my team i love what they do i love that we're more than some of it um but that you can see everyone's strengths and start to put that together and you know fit this kind of moving jigsaw together mm. I love that. I, I actually, I think I'm obsessed with the idea of people living in their strengths and living from their strengths because I think that's where things don't be as hard. And I think we have this idea that everything being really hard is really good. And I think, you know, I'm sure there'll be some advice that would have said, you know, when you were in the lab finding that particularly difficult, that you should have doubled down more effort. And actually, I'm now becoming an advocate for quitting the thing that isn't serving you. I'm like, that's not good for you. But I did. That's it. I was there till like midnight, and you know, stressing about it and crying in the confocal room, and mm. just putting hours in and hours in and hours in, and really coming to absolutely hate it and mm. not getting anywhere. And and also, you know, as you progress as a research scientist, you need papers and data and results, and sort of sitting there. And really, the the kicker for me was getting to the end of the week, 
and you know I've crossed off all these things on my to-do list all my experiments that I was meant to do and you know none of them had worked I may as well have just thrown everything in the bin on Monday mm. and sat in the park for a week or the pub um and the, the amazing thing uh, when I joined Cancer Research UK mm. was I'd have a to-do list and at the end of the week it would be done and mm. like the first I think the first fortnight I was there my um my boss she like she caught me in the office and i was i was still there at something like seven o'clock at night i was the only person working in the office i'm like the newbie mm. because i was like oh my god this is amazing i'm writing stuff and i'm doing stuff and it is staying done and she said she said you know you you can go home we're not paying you to stay past 5 30. and i sort of looked at her and was like i don't feel tired yet and that was and that was how, mm. just how, how much energy that had got me. That you would just stay until you were exhausted because there was always, you know, always experiments to be done and things to be fixed mm. and done again and again and again. And like, if you just banged your head against the wall harder, maybe you'd get through it. Um, and yeah, and uh, that, that was not true. No, no, I love that. I actually I love that because I was reading some stuff that you said about when they were trying to get more women into STEM and they were making everything pink and you said how hey, you like pink and it made me think about what you're saying now even that there's almost a space for everyone but you've got to find the place where you're good at it and it's banging your head against the wall it isn't pinkifying it it's not that sit doesn't sit true to what you are and what your strengths are I think that's brilliant yeah because I think that's where like you've been so successful but I have to say it's not just luck you took a massive pivot in just leaving and your organization is starting this new business right um and obviously it's so successful where everyone's coming to you for communication and the life science bit so what would you say to people who also maybe they know what their strengths are they're doing bits but they're not quite confident enough to go full-on behind it and back themselves like you've been able to back yourself yeah I, I mean it's I certainly I've been very lucky to have people around me who have really supported me. So my partner, Martin, um, he's absolutely amazing. So I, I got together with him in that tumultuous year. Of, <laughs> Big year. Of, of the book and oh gosh. Of, yeah. So that was a, that was a time. Um, um, yeah. But um, basically, he's he's absolutely amazing because I think um, you know, kind of real talk mm -hmm. here that mm -hmm. there are there are men and men that I have been in relationships with who are very intimidated by smart women, um, noisy women, women who are, you know, a lot, which you've probably gathered I am. Um, I <laughs> but, you know, that, that, is, that is a tough thing if you mm. want a quiet life. Um, but the amazing thing about Martin is, you know, I, he does find me kind of some, he's, sometimes he's like, Sh you're shouting again. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he's, he's completely confident in himself and his own abilities and his own mm -hmm. skills and he's like i want you to thrive i want you to go as far as you can go with your life because you're amazing and to be with someone who makes you feel like that it's mm. it's incredible because he's like oh you'd have done all this without me you would have done it because you're a hustler and like yeah i am a hustler i i did build a freelance career by myself i kind of i got gigs and i i got relationships with editors and I got book deals and I did all that by myself um and I'm like oh no no you know you've helped me but I think the confidence to go even bigger so now mm. I I would never have dreamed even five years ago that I would now have a team of 10 people and that we'd be you know doing what we're doing the the turnover that we're you know the sums of money now are just like bonkers to me um but you know they're even not very big people who run much bigger businesses are like oh that's a tiny amount of money um, but I would never have dreamed five years ago that I could have done this so having someone who's always like well what you've got here okay well what's the next step what's the next step like brilliant you've done it but like what are you going to do next in a lovely like the world is out there what are you going to do next with it and being with someone like that I think has been incredible and then also um the first person I recruited into my company Sarah she was a, a colleague at Cancer Research UK and I recruited her into the team at Cancer Research UK because she was just amazing. She was so organized, so nice, so wonderful. And she quit her job at another charity the day I founded the company. So that's like 
of serendipity oh, wow. um, and I said can you come and help me with my finance spreadsheets because I'm going to be thrown in prison by HMRC if I don't get this right <laughs> and, and she started out on two hours a week and now mm. she's like my chief operations officer she's my right, absolute right hand woman and um and again just like she and I kind of sit there going like it sort of feels a bit like we're still playing shop but like what can we do next what how are we going to grow this it's it's really really incredible do you know what that's so encouraging for anyone listening to this because first of all like you make it seem so doable like oh i'm just playing around and expanding <laughs> and it's in also incredible <laughs> I, I, that's the thing. I never expected to be running a business because I never saw myself as running a business. I have listened to a lot of business podcasts. I will tell you that um, because I'm like, I don't know. What do you need? So, oh my God, I need a pension scheme. Oh no! Like, I, I need a business strategy. Oh, we need a. Oh, what's the this and that? And you know, I've I've just had to learn yeah. how to do it. I, I did not expect to be running a business but there is so much information out there and so much support particularly for women running businesses like you know there's increasing networks to mm. to help you know just talk to the people around you and, and surround yourself with good people who are going to put mm. you forward and say like well, what's next what's next in an exciting way rather than like oh what's next you know bigger harder faster but like yes the world is out there yeah because that's actually not just bigger bosses the intentionality of i'm curious to see what you could do or aren't you curious that's fantastic and i think it's so important to think about the people that surround us because often people talk about their success and their story but it's very much in isolation but you definitely have weaved all the way through even your key pivotal moments people and how people play a part in your life and that's really interesting from the first hire to you know the right partner i love that yeah people are no, important. absolutely are yeah, yeah with the idea of that I, I recently read a book called by Dan Sullivan called 10x and he talks about the who's all the time and I, I think that's literally what you're just highlighting the who the people in your life and if they've got the right intent and they want to see you go big and let you be all the who you, that you are that's amazing I love that yeah and it, it's it's also like doing doing this stuff like whatever you do whether you're building a career or building a company it's like you're you're building something even if it's just your own brand and your own kind of career path but and you but you get to choose and the other thing i will say that's been really important to us is our values so this is something that martin made us do right at the beginning when we set up the company we were on the, on the the living room floor we had all these like big flip charts and he said okay you're a company a company is a group of people doing things you know it's nothing magic it's just a group of people who decide to do a thing and he said well you need company values and i was like no so <laughs> this is the kind of you know you, you walk into a big office and it's the thing that's on the behind reception that you know four words like you know nonsense um and i said uh, this is rubbish uh don't want this but he said no this is really important because if you do this and do it right yeah. these will be the values that are your compass for every decision mm -hmm. that you make going forward as a business um and i think this is also so true if in your personal life and everything like you know what whatever if you have actually been honest about what you value and use that as a decision making compass you will kind of be going in the direction you want to go and it makes decisions a lot easier and we mm. decided that the things that were really important to us were quality like just the quality of what we do um understanding that like we understand the science and that also mm. that our clients understand what we do like understand the importance mm. of comms um integrity so we're not going to work with companies where we don't think the science stacks up i get approached by quite a lot of companies where i'm like mm -hmm. um. <laughs> and uh and also that we're not going to promise them you know we're not going to promise them things that we can't deliver on or you know voodoo marketing magic that we can't deliver on um and then respect as well and that's that's absolute it's for us in our relationships with our staff it's contractors it's clients all the way down um and we really live by them mm. we recruit people according to them we are like you know our appraisals and everything are done on them everything we do is like does this line up with our values every client that we work with does this line up with our values and our mission mm. to be improving global well-being and if you're like, yep, yeah, then yep, yeah, 
that's an easy decision. And if you're like, oh, I'm not, not comfortable with this, so it's like, oh, I don't think this backs up, or mm -hmm. oh, no, we, we can't do a good job of this, then, then we won't do it. That's really important, I think, having your own core values and like a compass that everyone has. And I love that you kind of put it at the heart of your business, and that's really, really important. But you talk yeah. about getting big results. I know marketing really, but you have had epic success in this space. And I have to go back to the question that I'm like, how did you raise 8 million for cancer research? We thought it was one campaign, one campaign. Yeah. That was so that was nothing to do with me apart from my face. So that was entirely, so the campaign itself was the work of Aaron, who was our social media manager. So this was the no makeup selfie campaign, which I think was about, Ooh, 2008, 2009, it was a while ago. I was a lot fewer wrinkles then. But um, so he, he, we just really got a social media manager. So this is kind of in the early days of it. Mm -hmm. And um, and he noticed that there, there was just starting to be this, like a few people doing no makeup selfies. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I think we can get on this and, uh, um, and, and use it for a cause. And he looked around the office and I was the only person not wearing makeup because I didn't usually wear makeup to work. I only wore makeup when I was on TV or on Instagrams. Um, but I didn't normally wear makeup. But also mm. because I was a media spokesperson, I was like, I'm happy to have my face out there. So we took a really quick snap. It's like literally that's the one snap. And it went absolutely viral. And we, uh, I think in the end it was like 10 million pounds. I think we oh, raised. Wow. And it, it was, it was mad. Um, also, because when you suddenly get that amount of money coming into a charity, you're like, oh, crap. Mm. <laughs> like, how, what do we do with it? Do we ring fence it for something? <laughs> it's not that easy to like take in and then figure out what you're going to do with that amount of money that actually mm. makes the people who feel that they donated, that they've donated to something rather mm. than just into a black hole. So, um, mm. so yeah, it was interesting to be on the, the inside of that. And then how did we try and keep the momentum going? But yeah, certainly I, um, I don't take credit for coming up with that, uh, but yeah, it, it was my face. Oh my, that's incredible. I was really, I was like, that's so cool. But I mean, that's incredible. I think like sometimes some of the things you mentioned as well, so sometimes it's the opportunity, just the timing, like there's the right thing at the right time. Like you were doing Naked Scientist the, the pre-podcast time, because it was a radio show. Now you, can, you, you I access it by podcast. But like you can't have done things right before they become a thing. Is that like something that you'd attribute to be really critical for your story? Um, I don't know. I think I've always been someone who's like had a go. And this actually, this is pertinent to a work story that we're incredibly proud of. Um, I'm incredible. So uh, up, up there, where is this? Try and get the right, the pencil going the right way. That mm -hmm. is, yes, um, is two drum awards. And those are very prestigious um, kind of digital agency awards there. And we got those for the work that we did with Zoe on the Zoe COVID study. Mm -hmm. And that was like this massive thing in the pandemic. It was the biggest COVID symptom study in the world. And we did pretty much all the, the content writing for that. We wrote a lot of the stuff that went in the app. We supported the press team, who was one woman called Ellie. Um, but the whole thing that that came about, it's like, oh my God, how does this little agency, because at the time there was like three of us, mm. how does this tiny agency end up doing the world's biggest COVID study, like doing the wow. comms on the world's biggest COVID study? And it was because we were already working for Zoe. So Zoe now, you, you might see them there. Um, they've got the yeah. nutrition product. Yeah. Yep. You see the, the, the glucose monitors. I'm sure you're getting all the ads on Insta. Um, oh, my ads. <laughs> so I started working with them. They were one of my first biggest clients, actually. In um, It was right at the beginning of 2019. So the company, like my company is only a year old at this point. If, if that, I think, less than a year old. We start, I started working with them because they were looking for a science writer mm. and I talked to them and I was like, I think you need more than a science writer. You need help with your social. You need to rewrite your website. You need content. And this is when they were starting to do this nutrition product and they hadn't even launched yet. So, you know, I wrote their first website for them and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we got things up and running and, and going. And you know, at, then they brought in a new like, VP of brand and marketing at the end of um, 2019. In agency world, you kind of know that this is a sign, and the first thing they're going to do is fire the agency. <laughs> so, 
so you know it came to the end of our contract and they were like we're not we're not going to renew your contract because we just want to you know, see what's going on here okay and so we were like fine you know where we are call me um and sure enough like two months later hi uh can you come back and in february of 2019 we signed a contract for six months with them and i thought right six months writing about blood glucose and blood fat and all the kind of the nutrition and the microbiome brilliant nice job thank you and then the month after that may uh, march the 13th 2020 not sure where you were at that point but uh i get a phone call from from sarah the brand the vp of brand and marketing and she says um yeah that the developers they've built this app for covid um we're launching it i need a press release uh, we're launching it next week help like right and because i'd got all my experience in cancer research uk and mm -hmm. like public health communications and the like the care that you have to take and the responsibility you have to take and you know always making sure that things are evidence-based and cautious and informative and clear mm -hmm. i was like right we're doing this and um yeah they'd launched and within a week they had a million users and within a month they had four million users and it was really fundamental to like the uk pandemic response um mm. so yeah for two years we did all the pretty much all the written content for the blog for the app um and it was wild <laughs> and then <laughs> so when everyone else grew it was a business because there's a huge amount of work yeah it was it was crazy like at one point we were you know doing it was and it was mostly just me and my writer emily just working absolutely flat out and like and she had two kids um uh, we were having to pay her time just to sit in her car on her own so she could just have some downtime mm. um like not working and not with her kids yeah. uh, again all through the pandemic and so when when everyone else was like learning to play the trombone and making sourdough mm. i was like i'm just writing about COVID <laughs> for two years um, and then also we took on a bunch of other clients during that time and like we grew the team um, and uh, yeah, it was really kind of coming out the other side of that with knowing what we were doing, knowing that we delivered something massive like that. Um, yeah, and it was, it, yeah and, and you know, a little, little bit more on the shelf. And an award, well. and an award, <laughs> we love an award. Brag, I would have brought it right to the table and be like, this is my award. I'm not being humble. We worked hard for that award. Look at the award. See the award. That's incredible. I've been like that. Well, no, no, so I was on a call a little while back with um a guy who was like he was a real PR guy. He was like you know giving it all this and and um and he sort of looked over my shoulder because uh, this is my Zoom background normally. It's like looked over my shoulder and said, "Is that a drum award?" And I went, "That's two drum awards." I love. I love it. I back it. I'm all about women who sitting in there. Like, I am uh, like such a wanker. No, it's never. You've got to sit in your authority. This is it. You've built the expertise from all the way back, and you know, for degree post grad, every single project to grow in the business. You sit in that. We did that. Look we at that. that. We did. Yeah, but I did it. I did it all with people, and I think that's the thing. It's like none, none of this I really done just by no. myself. I've always had support encouragement you know the team the people with me and then like you know we working with clients we're all that's all part of the team working with editors you know you write an article or a book you've got editors working with you and it's really important mm. to acknowledge yeah. what they do because you know, all of all of us need someone to find the typos and tell us when our sentences are too long definitely we all need that team so i always want to end on three wisdoms and i know you've given me I don't know how many, like oh, oh, more than three already. You've just been like dropping them in there. Like, and here's a little bomb here. And here's a little wisdom bomb here. And here's one that people, teams, values. Ah, you, you nailed it. But honestly, is there anything else that you want to add? Like, this is it. You know, from all your so, wisdom, this is what you want to do. on a post it now. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I'd forget. Uh, so the one, the one I've said, so one of them I wrote down was the quote about, you know, the it's all about the choice the choice we any of us have from this moment yeah is the choice about what we're going to do next so like we choose where we're going and, and what we're going to do um so my my other one other wisdom um and this has kind of served me well as i've grown my career 
has been like always say yes mm -hmm. so when i was starting out i said yes to like all sorts of things i was like yes 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 but then the corollary of that is and then say no so at some point like you say yes you say yes to things you learn a bit more you like you start getting paid you get paid a bit more you know you sort of wrap it up try and try and do more things different things you kind of learn what you're good at mm -hmm. and you get known and you've got opportunities and like if you keep saying yes to things and then delivering on them you mm -hmm. get more opportunities and you kind of keep asking and keep you know keep saying yes when things come your way but at some point you have to start saying no and you have to kind of start saying no to the things that are low value um there's there's a kind of a thing in the writing world about you could never do any unpaid work like never do anything unpaid I'm like well mm. when you're brand new you're not very good to be honest like you, you you need a bit of like the discipline of having to deliver of like being edited of writing to deadline writing to brief um you know those kinds of things so you know but then at some point it's like you do not work unpaid like mm. you you know mm. you don't do talks unpaid you don't do things that you're not being valued mm. for because mm. i mean money is a way of valuing people um yeah. it's not the only way but it is it is a way and like certainly the more stuff that came my way i cannot say yes to everything because i've only got you know as many hours in the day as beyonce as the saying goes um but like i'm not going to drag myself to another country mm. or another part of the country to do something that's not paid because like my time is valuable and now mm. I'm, I'm getting creaky and i've got a garden i really like to be in and a partner that i'd really like to be with and a team that really needs me and clients that need me mm. so like mm. you know you have to value what you do yeah so then you have to start saying no to things that aren't sort of valuing you mm. in whatever way you decide to define value um yeah. and then the other one kind of talking about value so i've, I've got something about opportunity something about decisions and then something about money and money is a really interesting one because the biggest lesson that I've learned about money is thinking every time you see a number, is this a big number or a small number? And to who? Because this was really important when I was transitioning from being a freelancer to running a company. Because there was this really awkward point where everyone knew me as a freelance. And I was then running a company and you've got all the overheads of running a company and a team and like, you know, non billable hours and all this kind of stuff and overheads and pensions and things. And so people were like, well, you're very expensive now as a freelance. I'm like, I'm not a freelance. But it took me a long, long time to realize that I should be asking for more money. And that also when I was dealing with big clients, big companies, big organizations, you know, asking for another 500 pounds, another thousand pounds, that sounded like a lot on our bill and certainly a lot more than what I was used to asking for as a freelance. Mm. But to like, to them, it's nothing. Like, mm. and especially the bigger the numbers get, like, if you're asking someone for 10,000 pounds, unless that's the ceiling of their budget, they're probably good for 1100, you know, 11,000. Like, you know, so is this a big number or a small number? And then it's the same for when we're you know, paying people and paying freelancers. It's like small amounts of money can make a really big difference to some mm. people. Small amounts of money make absolutely no difference to big companies. So mm. it's always been like, what's the big number and what's the small number? And like when we're starting to negotiate as a company, um, that, that's been a very useful thing to just remember. Like, does this number look massive to me, but actually it's not very big to the client? Or, yeah. or is it the other way around? Or does the number that I'm offering to someone else, you know, look look big or small to them as well? And I think it's a really and if not, if it's not the right number, then it's, how far do I go in each direction? Yeah, that's, that's a really really practical bit of advice. And I don't think we talk about money enough, especially in the freelance speaking performing space at all. So no. like, which probably makes it much harder for people to be successful because they have none of the open conversations. That are yeah. Really helpful. So thank you. It's really yeah. amazing. And I, I also think we need some real talk about the world of science communication mm. and so much of it is done unpaid and voluntary, mm. which I think is mm. fine. But I think at some point there's a devaluing 
important of really skilled work um and so i think that like it is really important to value the skills that we have as people who can translate between science and english you know or science and any other language you know i think that is a really valuable skill and you know being paid to do things is not selling out like i don't know about you but you know <laughs> we've got we got rent to pay we got bills um but yeah. it, it's the way the the world goes and you, know, you need to decide based on your values what you're what you're prepared to do but also i think that people should value their time and their mm. their skills and their talent absolutely um, for sure i mean if you don't value it no one else is going to right like, and I think yeah. it, it goes right back to your story the start when you valued what you were good at. You said, like, this isn't the thing that's serving me, but this also this is what I'm really good at. And you're also in an organisation that are like, you know, you're talking about working in Elaine Fisher's lab and she's really valued science comms and doubling down on that. So that's really the, the zeitgeist of knowing, wait, 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 I'm great at this. I'm in a place that I'm valued and now I'm going to you know, get that return on investment and grow this big organization that you now run of 10 people doing amazing stuff that's incredible that's such good advice yeah i think i think it's really it's really important like we're we are very like the british are very icky about talking about money and i think particularly as sort of the the british middle class very icky about talking about money and and mm. like, oh, earning a living <laughs> i get my husband to do that he must not he must not, yeah. he must not have have an also how, how excluding it is the assumption that anyone can just afford to like do an unpaid internship mm -hmm. do work for free um do all this stuff like there's only a certain kind of person in a certain income bracket or with certain family wealth or husband wealth or partner mm -hmm. wealth wife wealth that can mm -hmm. do that for free so yeah. you're kind of excluding a whole bunch of people who are talented and skilled by you know saying that oh well we, we can't offer any money for this and i get asked to do a lot of events where um particularly academic events where they say it's like oh well you know we can just pay for your train and like that is two days out of my life and i do not have an academic position that's just funding me whatever i do like i don't have a full-time job mm. i'm running my, my own business and the time that i work in my business is what i get paid for yeah. and if i am off that is not I'm not earning money yeah so you know and, and some organizations find that very hard to wrap their head around it's like but mm. you know you can you could do this because you've got someone paying your your salary I'm like no, I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know and I I think it is it's you know, I'm, I'm not I don't particularly feel excluded from the conversation but like it's definitely excluding people from mm. being involved in this world yeah. um, by the kind of over reliance on on unpaid uh, and voluntary labour, I think. Yeah, I, that's absolutely. And I think we, I think that's a really, really really good point to raise, and I'll probably allow more diversity in the space anyway, because the minute people are all valued for it, they can actually do it as a job or something, rather than a thing that they do on top of things, which we have in our culture in this wonderful wonderful hustle culture that we live in, where everyone has five jobs <laughs> yeah so i think that's really important yeah it's a really important point you've given me a wealth of wisdom today i don't even know where to start i can't wait to rewatch this for my own note taking because this is incredible wow. one of the most candid conversations i've ever had and really practical advice as well i'm just so holistic in its nature so thank you so much for joining me on wednesday weekly wisdom i thoroughly enjoyed this conversation thank you thank you this has been a real delight it's been lovely to to get to know you thank you thank you you made my wednesday thank you <laughs> bye for now i hope everyone else enjoyed it this will be on instagram and on youtube and on spotify now so it'll be everywhere <laughs> so please listen because i so much wisdom in this conversation thank you so much dr cat thank you how do i leave Oh, <laughs> go back, go back, press the thing. I'll do the thing. <laughs> there we go.